it's it's supposed to be streaming. You should be good. Okay. I nailed it. All right. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Um, it's a it's a weeknight. It's late, and you guys are here, so I'm truly flattered by that. Um, tonight we're going to study algorithms by playing a game of pick two. We've got, we've got a few numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. Pick any two numbers that sum to 11. I, I want this to be interactive, so any two numbers that sum to 11, come on. Five and six. Five and six, okay, there's one. Any other numbers besides five and six? Six and five. Cool. <laughs> no, but it, it, that, that's, the, that's, that's great, because what happens is sometimes the order is important, sometimes it's not, and we'll talk about that through the presentation. Um, so. Oh, um, some housekeeping stuff. Um, the slides are in the meeting invite. Um, the blog post associated with this is on the meeting invite, so you guys can get it there. In case you guys don't remember any of that stuff, um, if you go to to Google and you type in, of course, the bit. I'm not used to, to having, not looking at what I'm typing. So here we go. I can do this. So if you type in the bit plumber, it actually shows up at the top on the first wiki page. And you just scroll down. And you just click on that. So in case you forget, in case you don't remember anything, just remember three words, the bit plumber, and you can just you know get all the information you guys need. Okay. Um, the other thing, when I do these types of things, there's a wide variety in terms of the group background, uh, and that's sort of tough to handle. So you know, ask questions, raise your hand, and interrupt me, because no matter what level I pick, it'll always be the wrong level type of thing. Um, all right. So. All right, so we talked about what appears to be a simple problem given six numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. Pick any two numbers that sum to 11, right? Somebody said five plus six. Uh, any other solutions? The other gentleman said uh, six plus five, and does the order matter? And of course, the famous answer is it depends, right? But if you're a consultant, you can't say it depends. You gotta say context appropriate answer or response. Okay, so. Um, Whenever you try and do these types of things, um, try to have a formal definition of the problem. You know, in an ideal case, you'd want to have a nice mathematical um, definition. You know, given a sudden blah blah blah. In real life, you try to have a mathematical definition with some additional requirements in English. By having formal definitions, it focuses people's attention, and this way, you know what you're delivering or what your goals are. So, you know. Fancy math is great, but most of the time you have some math with some English. Uh, okay. Please, go ahead, sir. Is that set an ordered set or not? I'm sorry, say that again? No, it can be ordered or not ordered. We're going to assume it's not ordered to begin with. Very good question, by the way. Um, so we're going to start with the simplest case. You've got a small quantity of integers. Um, so if you got a small quantity of integers, let's just brute force the thing. Now the thing to keep in mind, some people uh, look at brute force like it's a bad thing. To me, brute force is just one of n tools, right? If you've got a small set of numbers uh, and you've got enough computing power and you're in a hurry, there's nothing wrong with brute force. In this particular case, um, brute force consists of nested for loops, right? Uh, you, do, you do a bunch of nested for loops, you look for your condition, if it's met, um, you return to true. If not, you just keep on going type of thing. So again, nothing wrong with brute force. Nested for loops are you know, your standard brute force approach. And if you've got anything of any size, whenever you start doing nested for loops, red flags should go off. Um, now, of course, you did the brute force. Things won't work fine. But then you're cursed by success, right? Because your boss comes along, your client says, we love that algorithm, people are using it, but we've got, people are using too many numbers, we're spending too much money on Amazon, so you gotta do something smarter for us. So then you sit there and you think about things, and you say, 
and you look for patterns. And then you realize that 2 plus 4 is equal to 4 plus 2. So now you've found a pattern. So usually when you find patterns, that means you can reduce the amount of computations because you can take advantage of the patterns. Now, now we can get fancy. You know, 2 plus 4 is equal to 4 plus 2. Um, you can use fancy name for it. It's the commutative property of addition. That allows you to have a symmetric matrix. So, for example, you got 1 plus 6 and 6 plus 1, right? 2 plus 6 and 6 plus 2. So the, the, the matrix is symmetric. So it makes no difference whether you process the top half or the bottom half because, you know, uh, it's the same. All right. So by having this one pattern, you've been able to reduce the amount of work involved by half because you do the top half of the matrix or the bottom half of the matrix. So you reduce by your work by half and you go, you're all happy about this. So how do you implement that? It's very simple. You still got your nested for loops, but now you just got to be a little bit, let's see if I can do this. Uh, now you just got to be careful with the second for loop. You want to go from zero to I, and I is the uh, index for the um, most outer loop. So that's the only thing you have to be a little bit careful with. And all you've done by just changing the index of the inner loop, you've reduced your workload by half. So you're all happy, right? Hey, you know, I've reduced my workload by half. I'm proud, and so on and so forth. But now, as usual, you're cursed by success again, right? Your boss comes up to you. Great algorithm. You know, I'm glad you reduced the workload by half, but more people are using it. They're using more numbers. So can we do better? So... So you're thinking, you know, I just reduced the workload by half, and they're still complaining. So let's, let's talk about how bad the problem really is. So what happens is you can, um, you, first you realize that you're doing permutation without repetition. And you go, well, okay, I got an n factorial, n plus factorial. Eh, that, that fancy math, not sure I understand that. Look at the big O notation, you realize that it's, it's, since you've got two nested for loops, that's n squared. You look at that and you say, yeah, that's pretty yucky, n squared. But, you know, I'm not a mathematician. I, I want to do some, I'm going to plug in some numbers. So, if you notice, if I have 10 integers, I could do, I'll, I might end up doing approximately 100 uh, additions. If I have 100 integers, I might do 10,000 additions. If I have a thousand integers, I might do a million um, additions. So that means for each order of magnitude increase in the number of integers, I have a two order of magnitude increase in the number of computations. So I go from 10 to 100, I go from 100 to 10,000, I go from 1,000 to a million. So you could say, yeah, even though I reduced the work in half, it still sucks. <laughs> or, um, so, we've got to come up with a fundamentally different approach. So, I'm going to use a, a four-letter word, and it starts with S. And it's not the word that you guys are thinking of, okay? And it's also not that white stuff that falls from the sky. S-O-R-T, sort. There, I said it. Okay, now, I have to admit I'm a recovering database administrator, and the only thing that databases seem to know what to do is, is sorting. All right. So um, to the gentleman's point back there, is the list sorted or not? What we're going to do is we're going to make sure that it's sorted. Because if we know that it's sorted, we have a priori knowledge about the system. And if, we, and if the system is sorted, we can do a binary search. If the thing isn't sorted, you, you'd have to do something brute force. Or you sort the sucker. So this fundamental different approach, we're going to do a sort, and then we're going to do a binary search. All right. Now, um, we're lucky that, Py that Python has this bisect module. Uh, so you import the, bis the bisect left, um, and you, you know, have one for loop, and then you just uh, do the binary search, and you're all set. Again, I'm a firm believer in working code snippets, so this way, um, when you, there's a, a lot of arguments and go away as soon as you have working code. Because this way, you know, you can't pontificate, you gotta actually have working code. So you're all happy um, because you went from 
n squared to n log n, right? But then your boss like rolls his eye, n squared versus n log n. What, what, the, what the heck does that mean? Well, if you notice, n squared is this blue line here. Notice how it goes, how it shoots straight up, okay? And here, if you notice, this is the purple line is n log n. So, you know, you can tell somebody, well, I went from an n squared problem to n log n problem. What does that mean? This is the old fashioned 1,000 words, um, pictures worth 1,000 words thing. So we went from n squared, which if you notice, just shoots straight up this blue line to n log n. So that's fairly linear. So you go, cool, you know, a lot of progress here. Okay. Now, how did you prove that other than just trying it out? How did I prove? From, from the code you wrote, how did you know it was n log n? Okay, good question. Okay, so um, um, a good rule of thumb uh, when you do a, a binary, when you do a sort, it's, it's an n log n operation. When you do a binary search, you, you, you can look this stuff up. Okay. Um, That's a priori knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> it's just when, when you when you're in this type of thing and you do this thing long enough, um, you can actually look up things like you know uh, like sorting is is an n log n operation, okay. binary search is an n log n operation. So you do n log n log n plus n log n, and you get two n log n, which is approximately n log n when you get to large numbers. But very good question. Oh, this is great. Go ahead, sir. Okay, but notice you don't, you're assuming that you, state your question again, I'll do it a little slower. No, it's just an assertion. <laughs> Namely, say that again. If, if the number you're trying, if the sum you are trying to achieve sure. is greater than mm -hmm. the sum of the two largest integers. Okay, great. Notice, notice you assume that you knew the two largest integers. It's you, but no, no, hang on, hang on. Hang on, no, no, no. Let, let's, let's follow that through. Okay, if you, you sort the thing, right? Okay, that's step number one. Then you, then you have to go through the entire list to figure out, you have to read the first one and you have to read the second one, right? So, no, no, let's, no it's a good point. So you sort, then you have to figure out the, then you have to figure out the two largest numbers. Okay, so you have to go to the, you have to go to the, when you sort, you don't know the length of the list. So you gotta find out what the length of the list is. Then you got to go to the last two elements and add those up. So, and you could do that, but you know, how complex do you want to make your algorithm? Because what you're doing is you're applying short circuit logic and that's perfectly acceptable, but just think about the additional complexities that you could get into. It's a very, very, very valid approach, but you know, don't skip the step of you have to, you know, go to the, you have to find the last two items in your list and you have to add them and you have to add an, uh, an if statement to your processing. Nothing wrong with that, but just consider the pros and cons of that. Thank you very much. He's gonna keep me on my toes here. Okay, um, anything else? This is great interaction. Okay, now we just figure out how to click. The, the problem is find all two digits. Right? The question, okay, that's a really good question. Do you want to find all the, all the combinations or just the first one? And here we're assuming just the first one. Oh, okay. Because if you have to find them all, then you got to process all the that's data. That's what I was thinking, yeah. because it's, you could work from the back tail. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. No, 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 this is, this is great. You, you work from the largest, you could use that as your seed of the, whatever the problem is, yeah. and you'd find it fastest that way. Correct. But if you needed to find them all, then you're going to have to go through them all. Correct. Love the interaction. Great guys. Anyway. Cool. All right. Uh, now I just got to figure out how to move the cursor here. Okay. So we did our picture. Oh. All right. So um. Yeah, right, I got to figure out how to use. It. Okay. So you think you're all set? Then you've always got the a Python expert or Java expert saying, "Look, you're doing too much thinking, right?" Just use the built-in functionality of the uh, of the list.index, or just use the in operator, and you're done. Why are you doing all this analysis? 
The downside of using the list index or the um, or invoking the in operator in uh, in Python is, is again you're going to have a for loop and then the in operator and you're back to the n squared operation. For small sets of data, you will never notice a difference. But if you've got like a million a million numbers and so on and so forth, you will begin to notice. And that gets you, gets you back to the n squared um, situation, and that's yucky. All right. Now, again. Once again, you're cursed by success. All of a sudden, people love your system. Um, they're using it a lot more. They're using a lot more numbers. And your boss says, can you do better? And you're thinking, wait a minute. I'm, I'm at n log n, which is fairly linear. And you know you have to go through each number at least n times. You know, what can I do to, go, to do it better? So now you're really stuck. And this, by the way, I think cursed by success is a good thing to happen. But okay. Um, so when you when you're sort of really stuck, the thing to think about is, can we um, uh, um, uh, reduce or make the problem simpler? Uh, so let's put the restriction that repeated integers are not allowed. Um, so that a lot that means you can use Python's built-in set set stuff. What set does is if you get a duplicate, it just ignores it and doesn't tell you about it. I mean that seems weird, but you know when you, when, you're, when you're doing set operations, all that you want to know is something in the set or not. You don't want to know whether there's two or three of them. But the downside of using a set, you got to initially create that whole thing. So there's a zero n cost to it, but that's better than n log n. And again, it's just a one-time function, a one-time cost. The other thing when you use set, set stuff, in the background what you're doing is you're doing a hash. And sometimes hashing can be problematic. Um, and the other thing is when you're using sets, you have additional storage requirements because you've got to store your hash values, where before we weren't storing anything. Um, I'm no expert, but what happens is a, a hash function is a mathematical function. So what happens is um, the goal is to be able to create a unique number for each value. But sometimes, just because of the nature of your data or your na nature of your function, you get what they call collisions. So you have, you know, two. Say you've got the letter A and, and F. You want the letters A and F to to generate a different number. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, uh, okay. Um, I, I just uh, took this out of. Uh, okay. So I just took uh, took this out of Stack Overflow. Um, you know, you you create your set. And what happens is this is a fancy generator function. So if you guys want to have it all fancy in one line, or you can do uh, for loops instead. But just since this is a Python group, I thought I'd show some fancy Python. Yeah. Or I think it's fancy. I think it's fancy Python to me. Wait, and that's it? Yeah. OK, I, I'm not familiar with Python. So I assume any just returns, does any return a, it doesn't return a Boolean, it has a return um, no, um, any, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, so, go ahead, Are, do we have any Python experts, but, it's a, it's a bool. it's a boolean. okay, yeah, so any does return a boolean. Can, can someone just explain the, the last line, and I'm like, not at all following this last line. Okay, I, I'm no expert, but what happens is, um, for n instead of input. Okay, yeah. Okay, so that's, that generates, um, Again, I'm not. Oh, okay, I see. I see. Okay, so you're taking the desired sum, you're subtracting n off of it, and if that number is in the set of input, okay. Cool. Yeah. And if it returns yes or no. Right. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. It doesn't so actually return. It's not returning the two numbers. No, it's just returning whether it exists or not. Okay. 
So, and that, that's a valid point. Do you want to know does it exist, or do you want to know do you want or do you want the numbers? So, so you just return desire some minus n, and then n. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, go to the original problem. Was so this is saying if uh, if you look at six in the set and the sum. 11 minus 6, 5. If 5 is in the set, then it just returns a true value. Yes, okay. correct. And, and again, that goes back to explicitly defining the problem very carefully. Do you do, when you define the problem, did you want to know just were there two numbers that summed 11, or did you want to know the numbers themselves? Mm. Oh, right, okay. okay. But, so, if you, but if you wanted the numbers, you just, just return n and desire some minus n. Yeah. So you have to. Cool. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's summarize. We started with a, what appeared to be a simple problem, right? You get six numbers. Just pick any two that sum to 11, right? What could be so hard about that problem? But notice we had, we tried four different solutions. We used brute force. We took advantage of a symmetric pattern. We did a sort with a binary search. And then we did this hashing set stuff. So even for a simple problem, if you really think about it, you can have multiple approaches and that type of thing. So the question is, which solution? And we get back to our famous answer, it depends. So, you know, the goal here wasn't to, to teach some fancy, not to, the goal wasn't to, to talk about how do you sum two numbers, because we all know how to sum two numbers. The goal was to state a simple problem and to sort of think about the process of how you would analyze and try different approaches. And if you notice, something as trivial as six numbers, give me, give me any two that sum to, to 11, notice how that turned into a fairly involved type of conversation, different approaches. So when, you know, when you're doing algorithms and that type of thing, you know, uh, Please consider the various options, pros and cons associated with it. And don't just use the API because, you know, um, you might get something out the, the door today, but, um, uh, hmm, I was looking for, uh, I had a really funny slide. <laughs> No, I'll dig it up. Just okay. So what happened was the um, uh, I, I was new to uh, PowerPoint, so I, I screwed up. So I can still get I can still recover if you guys give me a few secs. Uh, they better be good. They are good. I promise. I promise. <laughs> uh, Uh, okay. So I don't know if you guys can see that a um, driver, <laughs> a driverless police car pulls over a driverless civilian car. Police officer gets out and asks the civilian, "Do you know why my car pulled over your car?" <laughs> so um, just you know, just think about what, what's going on. I mean, don't just blindly use the uh, API because they'll get you into trouble, like we did with the in and so on and so forth. Uh, the other um, thing you don't want to happen to you, um, I don't know if you guys can see this, um, you have um, a bunch of robots running around doing work, the humans behind the glass, 
And the caption says, in case of emergency, break glass. So you don't want to be in that situation either. Um, so I'm really interested in this type of stuff. Um, if you guys have interesting problems you guys want to talk about, um, you know, it's Robert Lucenti or R. Lucenti at pipeline.com. As I've showed before, just you can go you can go to Google and type in the bit plumber, and you should be able to find me. So, uh, so just think about you know what you guys are you know when you guys are doing these types of algorithms about various options, pros and cons. Again, there's nothing wrong with brute force. Go back to the two pointers slide. Well, that's the one solution that I find elegant. Oh, the oh, okay. The, the one with the two pointers at what end? The yeah, approach. yeah. So what happens is I screwed up my. Um, my PowerPoint slides. So um, this is Brian Wongchart, by the way. He's the guy that intro originally introduced me to the problem. So another approach uh, to the problems for the C people is you're just walking pointers. So this is um, a big O of N time solution on an initially sorted input list. And, and key point is initially sorted, so you at least have N log N upfront cost. And um, Could anything you else you walk through that one? I, I read it on your blog. It really makes sense of it. Brian, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm no expert on this. I remember you showed this to me. Do you want to give it a shot to try to talk? You have to ask yourself, how do you know that this is correct? Um, uh, the uh, idea of the algorithm is that uh, you are proving at each step um, that uh, the uh, two numbers that you want uh, are between the left pointer and the right pointer. So in, if you look at the first condition, the if test, uh, if a sub l plus a sub r is equal uh, to x, um, you're looking for um, uh, the uh, indices of the two numbers that have the desired sum. Um, uh, so uh, you are eliminating at each iteration of the loop uh, one of the two possible ends uh, are from the range that the desired numbers could be in, right? Uh, so in the case where you move the left pointer one step to the right, um, you see that uh, if uh, uh, the sum of the smallest number in your potential range uh, and the largest number, that is an E sub L plus E sub R, is still too small, then clearly uh, the left end of the range is useless. Yeah. Because uh, even if you took the, the very largest number that's left and added to it, it still falls short. Mm -hmm. uh, the symmetric case is that um, uh, if uh, uh, the uh, very smallest number you have added to the right end is still too big, uh, then clearly the right end of your range is useless. Um, because you couldn't possibly have added anything smaller to it. Uh, so by uh, iterating, on discarding either the left or the right side of the uh, potential set of numbers, um, it shrinks by one on each on this, on each loop iteration. Yeah, in worst case, the numbers are right in the middle, but you've only mm -hmm. gone through n times, yes. so or r r really n over two yeah. times. Yeah. So, uh, but it's still big of, of n. You could do the same thing with slices, couldn't you, in Python? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Move n from the yeah. edge. Yeah. The same. Yeah. The same thing. And it's it's nice. Yeah. Um, and if. Uh, oops, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, that's even worse. So, so, so is the best you can. So, so the best you can do is you have to you have to have it sorted. So, but if, if you're given a sorted list, you can make sure it's a big O of N. No, but yeah, okay. You can test them all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So is there a vague estimate of like what magnitude of list would you have to get out where like the sort the initial sort is worth it or is the initial sort always going to be worth it? Um to be honest with you, I, I never um I I haven't uh, that's pretty bad. Okay. <laughs> um Yeah, the answer is I, I, uh, the, the, I, I, unfortunately I never got a chance to actually run the uh, uh, metrics on, and the software to actually come up with real numbers. I mean, all you're looking for is one is n squared greater than n log n. 
Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so caching is a huge effect. Branch prediction. Uh, the exact microarchitecture of the processor um, would mm, have to be consulted to be sure. Uh, you know, in uh, the RAM model, as this is called mm, on capital REM in algorithms textbooks, uh, it's a very primitive model for processors where every sure. instruction takes the same amount of time. So as in practice, an instruction can take multiple clock cycles or less than one clock cycle on average. Yeah, it's just trial and error. Yeah, yeah well, no, no, but it, 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 you're right, it's trial and error, but, but you can sort of take a guess. For example, if you've got a um, hundred, you have a, a, the potential for a million, right? Because if because 100 n squared is, you know, not 100. If you have a thousand numbers, if you square that, it's approximately a million with, the, with that n factorial, if you remember on the previous graph. Mm -hmm. Is it going to blow up? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you, can, you can do rules of thumb, you know, it's not trial and error. So if you've got uh, a thousand numbers, you might have to do uh, a million um, uh, additions. That's not bad, right? Because, you know, you've got 13 MIPS at. Uh, I mean, sorry, you've got five MIPS, 13 milliseconds for a disk I.O., you've got 65,000 instructions. So, you know, if you've got a thousand uh, numbers and you've got a million additions, who cares? But if you've got, you know, uh, you know, uh, 100,000 numbers, now it's no longer... So you can begin to get a feel for, do I really need to benchmark this or not? So it's, it is trial and error, but you can be smart about when you start to trial and error. In general, uh, compilers and processors are very good at optimizing loops with sequ sequential memory access. Okay. Uh, whereas following pointers, as in a tree structure, can be extremely expensive. Okay. Mm. And um, the only thing that I, the other thing that I had is um, unit testing. Um, something as trivial as this, if you notice, we had four different scenarios to try, and if you didn't have unit tests. You would, you would never know that the four things were giving you the same answer. So even though it, the problem's trivial, it's still worth the time to come up with some unit tests to make sure that the thing works. And frankly, I actually have 104 unit tests, which are you know on my blog post. You can link to them, and it seems excessive. But what happens is, I was building this up. People would send me algorithms or give me suggestions, and I, I, and I couldn't do it ad hoc anymore, so I ended up writing a full set of unit tests. So you guys, even for something trivial, you guys don't have to do 104 unit tests, but you know, if you guys didn't have unit tests, how would you know that the third or fourth algorithm were giving you the right answer? So it's, you know, it's worth the unit tests. Uh, and I appreciate the questions and answers. You guys have my uh, contact information, so if you guys have other questions or just want to talk about other algorithms, I'm very much interested. Kind of thing. So, uh, and I appreciate all the questions. I mean, that type of thing. That's all that we had, unless you guys have Gosh. something else or. Uh, okay. That's all that I had, guys. So, you know, thank you very much, and let's keep in touch. That's